Weekdays at 12. The Night Beat starts right now. Tonight we begin with a developing story out of Uvalde. CNN now reporting that Uvalde CISD has hired a former DPS trooper who was at Robb Elementary. That report also says Crimson Elizondo is among the troopers under investigation for their actions or inactions on May 24th. Tonight, Elizondo appears on the Uvalde CISD website listed as a member of its seven person police department. But body camera video from the May 24th incident appears to show Elizondo outside the school. CNN says she arrived just two minutes after the gunman went inside. These clips were released by Uvalde's mayor tonight. Now, Elizondo does not appear to have any body armor or a long rifle. Body camera video also shows her inside the school during the 77 minute shooting. At one point, she can be heard saying, quote, if my son had been in there, I would not have been outside. I promise you that, end quote. Elizondo reportedly one of seven DPS officers referred to the Office of the Inspector General. The official referral made in July says those officers were identified for, quote, actions which may be inconsistent with training and department requirements, end quote. DPS has not officially identified those officers. We emailed DPS for confirmation tonight, but have not heard back. Now, parents of the Robb Elementary victims are sharing their frustrations over Elizondo's hiring tonight. A statement from the group Lives Rob says in part, quote, her hiring puts into question the credibility and thoroughness of UCISD's HR and vetting practices, and it confirms what we've been saying all along. UCISD has not and is not in the business of ensuring the safety of our children at school, end quote. Now, the statement goes on to call for the suspension of all UCISD officers pending an independent investigation. Now, they also want the results released to the public. Uvalde CISD announced that audit in August, but it's unclear when that investigation is going to be over. Now, this news comes as families continue to protest outside the Uvalde School District Central Office. Uzziah Garcia's guardian, Brett Cross, has spent the last week outside the administration building. He is still there tonight. Earlier today, he tweeted that he had spoken to Superintendent Dr. Hal Harrell again, saying, quote, steps have been made. Tonight, he is sharing comments from Uvalde victims' parents who are clearly upset with this latest report from CNN. We've also contacted the Uvalde School District for a response to this report about that officer, but have yet to hear back. Uh, families of the Robb Elementary victims continue to share their stories, and tonight the daughter of fourth grade teacher Eva Mireles is speaking for the first time. When I heard that she jumped in front of her students, I think my first thought was, of course, of course she would. That's just her. That was just who she was. 23 year old Addie Ruiz says that her mother was a hero long before May 24th. Four months after the shooting, Ruiz is advocating for stricter gun laws in Texas. And you can hear more of her interview tonight on Nightline, right after Jimmy Kimmel Live, right here on KSAT 12. A 17-year-old shot by a San Antonio police officer is recovering tonight, while the officer who shot him is apparently out of a job. Now, this happened Sunday in the parking lot of a, a McDonald's off of Blanco Road near West Avenue. And now... The public, including the people who know that teenager, are looking at footage of that body cam for the first time. The night, the night team's John Paul Barajas is following that story for us tonight. And we want to warn you, some viewers may find this video disturbing. Get out of the car. That's scary. Uh, I... I'm speechless, honestly. It's the first time Christopher Montalvo is seeing video of 17-year-old Eric Cantu yeah, as he's shot by a San Antonio police officer. Montalvo tells us he worked with Cantu at the wash tub earlier this year. He looks scared. He looks terrified. Uh, he doesn't know what's going on. Like, he was just in his car eating. That right there, uh, just, that personally didn't look right to me. Police Chief William McManus agreed. He fired that officer, James Brennan, for not following the department's protocol. Well, it started with the tactics he used to approach the vehicle. That was number one. Number two, it was shooting at the vehicle, um, both at the very beginning of the, of the video and then later the second volley, but both against policy, shooting at, shooting at, uh, at vehicles unless it's in the ultimate uh, defense uh, of your life. 
or someone else's. And the only reason Brendan was at the McDonald's was for an unrelated call. He was there for a, for a disturbance uh, at the McDonald's. Uh, he was distracted by a vehicle that he believed he saw the previous night and tried to stop, but it evaded. And then he decided to go over and approach that vehicle. Montalvo says he worked with Cantu for three months before Cantu left for a new job, but that they were able to catch up just two weeks ago when he came in for a car wash. Get good laughs. Uh, just normal, you know, normal human being stuff. Nothing really serious. He was never, I never got a bad vibe from him. He was always, like I said, really good guy to me. And he always respected every time I told him to do something, he always did it. And he worked hard. As Cantu continues his fight in the hospital, Montalvo has a message. Sorry that this happened to you, man. And I, I really hope he gets better. I hope he pulls through. The officer in this shooting, James Brennan, was a probationary officer just on the job for seven months. We asked the San Antonio Police Officers Association about him being fired. They sent us a statement that says they understand the decision, but that they're holding any comment until a full investigation is complete. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Paul, thank you. Arrested and charged. Barrow County deputies say they found the two, two teen suspects accused of shooting and killing an innocent woman yesterday during a drive-by. Now, because the suspects are underage, deputies aren't identifying them. But here's what we do know. The 14-year-old, who deputies think was the driver, is charged with murder, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, and evading arrest in a vehicle, along with unauthorized use of a vehicle. And the 15-year-old, who investigators say was a passenger, is also facing murder and aggravated assault and evading arrest on foot charges. The shooting happened at a home on Bald Mountain. The woman who lost her life was just 25 years old. Her name is Novita Brazil. And tonight we're getting new information about a story we first broke at 6 o'clock. We now know what led up to the large police presence at the Alisson Apache Courts tonight. The night team's Alyssa Cole was there as this unfolded. She has an update from police. It was a very busy scene at the Alizan Courts apartments. We got there just before 6 o'clock, but police tell us they arrived two hours earlier. That's when officers say they tried to pull over a stolen car with Florida plates. The driver took off, but SAPD's helicopter found it at the Alizan Courts. Officers dressed in tactical gear ordered eight people out of an apartment. Our cameras were there as they walked out with their hands above their heads. We are blurring their faces because some of them were eventually released. There are still several questions we're hoping to get answered, like how many people were arrested in their charges, what police found inside the apartment, and who the stolen vehicle belonged to. As soon as we find out those details, we'll keep you updated on our website at ksat.com. Alyssa Cole, KSAT 12 News. It's been almost a month since another shooting rocked the Uvalde community. Two teens shot at Uvalde Memorial Park. Four people arrested. The mother of one of those shooting victims tells the night team's Lee Waldman she is now joining other mothers in her community in calling for changes to keep kids safe. We're a blended family. Um, we adopted Bruce and Devin. We're, you know, we're their godparents. A blended family of five. Mom Irene Mungia couldn't be more proud of her kids, especially Bruce. He graduated from college before he graduated from high school. 18-year-old Bruce Brown works as a welder. He takes care of his younger siblings and helps his adopted mom and dad. He was going to go pick up his brother that day, and he just he wasn't able to make it. That day was September 8th. Police descended on Uvalde Memorial Park after a shooting. They called it gang-related. Get the story straight. You know, I'm here to say my son is not a, he's not gang related. He's not a gang member, none of that. Mungia says he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and he paid for it. He was shot in the chest. Um, his, uh, the, the bullet went through his lung. So it came in here and went out right next to his vertebrae. So his vertebrae was, um, it has a fracture. Bruce spent days at Bamsey. The shooting broke one of his ribs as well. He's home now, still recovering with his siblings by his side. A fact Mungia says she doesn't take for granted. My son was wearing his Uvalde Strong shirt. They literally were there for him. Like They saved him or it was a miracle or something, but we were so close to losing him. Mungia says there isn't enough patrolling of Uvalde's parks. We were at her daughter's soccer practice at another park and saw only one constable drive past. 
She believes more needs to be done for the children of Uvalde. We need change. We need better things for our kids. We need, you know, we need protection for our kids. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Now, part of the change Mongia is asking for healthy activities for kids to participate in so they stay out of trouble. At a previous city council meeting, Mayor Don McLaughlin actually announced plans are in the works to build a youth and family recreation center and a boys and girls club. No timeline yet for either one of those projects. Now coming up, San Antonio not leaving Florida behind. What one local organization is doing to help the people affected by Hurricane Ian as federal aid comes in. The fallout from the migrants sent unexpectedly to Martha's Vineyard continues. The Bear County Sheriff's Office has a new statement tonight about their ongoing investigation as the search for the woman to believe to be involved in all of this continues at this hour. Plus a town with no full time officers. Yeah, happened. We're going to go to Gray Forest and we're going to tell you about the mass exodus at its police department and also tell you how the mayor is trying to convince people they're safe. People in a small Bear County town are worried because all of the full time police officers in Gray Forest resigned and people are worried about how the town leader is handling that. But as the night team's Patty Santos learned, the town of 500 people has low crime numbers. A safety is a selling point for the rural town of Gray Forest, just north of Pelotas. We actually chose Gray Forest uh, because it was such a nice, safe, um, small town. But in recent weeks, it's four and a half paid police officers have resigned. We've talked to Bear County. They're helping cover, especially until all of this just settles down. Mayor Amanda Waldrop says she has hired some interim staff along with over 40 reserved officers. But she says the chief left due to philosophical differences in leadership. The deputy chief was named interim, but he accepted a new job. We have the interim police administrator who's trying to get some that make sure that the scheduling is all in place because we want for everybody to feel safe and comfortable. Residents worry the lack of full time officers will translate to a rising crime. There's probably someone out there that is thinking maybe now Gray Forest is a target and I'm worried about that. The mayor was newly elected in the spring. Residents say her approach to tightening the budget is part of the philosophical differences that led to the departures. Once Mandy became mayor, they, they had practically council meetings every week to try to get the uh, budget you know, back in a uh, reasonable position. Other folks who support the mayor say they don't support how she's handled this situation, but they do want to know how much money is going in and out of this police department. Everyone does agree Gray Forest needs a police force. I would love for there to be dedicated officers in the city of Gray Forest who are here, who get to know the community as these previous officers did. Patty Santos, KSET 12 News. And now for a look at your headlines in your night beat news flash. The Bear County Sheriff's Office releasing a statement tonight about the $10,000 reward for finding a woman named Perla Huerta. She's accused of luring migrants onto flights that landed them at Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. The reward is being offered by the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC. In the News at 5, the organization mentioned that a Bear County grand jury is also wanting information on this woman. Well, in a statement from BCSO, they said no findings of the investigation have even been given to the district attorney's office, who would ultimately be the one to present that information to a grand jury. The San Antonio help to Florida after Hurricane Ian just keeps pouring in. USAA provided their drone technology to assist with search and rescue efforts. Volunteers in FEMA rescuing more than 3,800 people and 200 pets. The president, Joe Biden, touring the devastation, meeting with those who've been affected. He also announced the federal government will pay for emergency response efforts for two months instead of 30 days. Our CPS energy crews also arrived in Florida last week, and today we have learned they helped fully restore power in Lakeland, Florida. Good job. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. All right, and now we're going to take a live look outside. There you go, the 410 and the I 10 interchange right there. 75 degrees right now, but tonight we've got a special forecast for you because let me tell you, a lot of people, so you know, it's subjective as to how the weather is, right? But we know our furry friends have been liking this weather. 
Oh my gosh, they have, especially after that humidity got knocked out. The pups have been loving it. Here's Fido's forecast for tomorrow, your dog walking forecast featuring KSAT 12 viewers Jacob and Winston. Awesome, cute dogs there. And if you want to add a picture of your dog to Fido's forecast, scan this QR code right now and you can actually, it'll take you to KSAT Connect feature. Not only can you add cute pictures of your pups, but you can also add pictures of the weather. We love that. All right, so let's take a look at Fido's forecast tomorrow. Walking in the morning, beautiful, 62 degrees. Right in the afternoon, 90 for the high temperature. So it is going to be a little bit too warm in the later afternoon hours, but still a pleasant day tomorrow. Today we got up to 88, so tomorrow will be just a degree or two warmer. And it's going to be a, a beautiful, beautiful day for us tomorrow. I just wish we could get some rain. Here's a look at the weather setup right now. You can look out toward New Mexico, west. Texas, the Panhandle. That's where the rain is right now. And unfortunately, that's where the rain is going to stay. A wider view across the nation, just some uh, showers uh, up approaching the Great Lakes area. But again, that cut off low pressure system here, it's going to stay to our south and to our west. Anywhere you see these reds, that's where the atmosphere is technically too dry to produce any rainfall. But as we head into Friday, notice that there's a little green blip that starts to pop up near the Rio Grande Valley. That's that's where we got a little bit more atmospheric moisture content. And so by Friday, there are going to be some areas of the Rio Grande Valley that do get some rain. Rain chances down there is about 30%. And there is an off chance, only 10%, that one or two of these showers could kick up a little bit north toward the San Antonio metro area. But if you live north of Highway 90, absolutely no chance for rain. So when we're talking about chances for rain, it's only 10% in San Antonio Friday and Saturday. That's it. That's all we got as far as rain chances go. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty pleasant. In the morning, we'll be looking at 62 in New Braunfels, 62 in Hondo, 64 in Del Rio, upper 50s in the Hill Country. These are sunrise temperatures, the coolest part of the day, 730 in the morning tomorrow when the sun rises. And then quickly, we'll be warming up 82 by noon. Some clouds tomorrow, and especially during the second part of the day, those high thin cirrus clouds that give us beautiful sunsets. So by sunset at 730, Try to step outside. You'll see a great sunset tomorrow. 90 for the high in San Antonio. It'll be 91 in Castroville, 92 in New Braunfels, 91 in Seguin, 90 in Pleasanton, 88 in Uvalde, 88 up in Kerrville and in Bernie, and 91 in Floresville, 92 in Gonzales. Otherwise, more of the same for us. Mornings will become slightly warmer, but still pretty pleasant. And then the afternoons will stay right at or just below 90 degrees. We still have not gotten that first real deal fall cold front, so I'm keeping my eyes peeled for that, but it's not going to happen the next seven days, guys. All right, thank you. All right, Greg, is it safe to say the Cowboys have decided to give Dak a little slack and not hurry him back? <laughs> yes, that is very safe okay. to say because he didn't practice today. He worked out with a trainer instead. So what is his status actually for game day? When we come back, we'll give you the latest update we have. And is this Red River rivalry a trap game for Texas? Coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dak Prescott did not practice with the Dallas Cowboys today, according to the NFL's official practice report. He's still working his way back from surgery on his thumb, on his right throwing hand. He fractured in the first game of the season. Cooper Rush worked out with the first team again today, and he's looking to go 4-0 this season. The Cowboys travel to Los Angeles to face the Rams on Sunday. One thing that will help is if the Cowboys can jumpstart their run game, which stalled against the Commanders for just 62 yards after coming into that game, ranked 11th in rushing, averaging 4.7 yards per game. Last week, uh, we didn't execute very well, and uh, so, I mean, we just got to kind of lock back in and, and uh, you know, make sure that we're, we're staying uh, good with our fundamentals and, and uh, get, get the run game back on track. All right, kickoff in L.A. on Sunday is at 3.25 p.m., and KSAT 12 Sports will be there. The Eastern Texans will be looking for their first win of the season when they travel to Jacksonville to face the Jaguars on Sunday. It's after getting booed at home by their own fans doing another slow start in which Houston was outscored in the first half 27-7 and wound up falling to the L.A. Chargers 34-24. A lot of the blame has fallen on the shoulders of second-year quarterback Davis Mills, who ranks 22nd in the NFL in completion percentage, 19th in passing yards, and 29th in quarterback ratings. He 
did help rally the Texans to score 21 points in the fourth quarter, but still fell short. So how does Mills balance proving yourself and solidifying his role? Just go out and play my game every week. Um, I mean, and it comes down to just going out there and being efficient, doing my job on offense and spreading the ball around to the playmakers. So I don't need to go out and make every single play. Um, or just go out and do too much is what I'm trying to say. But if I'm efficient with the ball, getting the ball out of my hands on time before the pass rushers get there and give my receivers catchable balls, then, I mean, everything else should work itself out. And kickoff in Jacksonville on Sunday is set for high noon. The UTSA Roadrunners have a dominating offense this season again, following their 45-30 victory on the road against Middle Tennessee. The Roadrunners are tied for the lead in the FBS when it comes to passing offense. It averages 365.8 yards per game. That's thanks in part to the performance of Frank Harris through five games this season. He's already thrown for over 1,724 yards, 12 touchdowns, while completing almost 70% of his passes with a quarterback rating of 162.7. He also has another four touchdowns on the ground, and remember, one receiving touchdown as well. Now they face Western Kentucky, the team they had to beat to win their first ever Conference USA title. I think O'Lange is doing a great job just giving me time back there. You know, the receivers just, you know, they're freaks. They go out there and make plays. Um, but I definitely want to shout out to them for getting a run game going. Uh, Brady and Trey, they did a great job of hitting the holes and just accelerating. So I definitely give a shout out to the O-line for that. All right, kickoff in the Alamo Dome this Saturday. It'll be a little later, set for 5 p.m. How are the Aggies preparing for Alabama with a Crimson Tide star quarterback questionable? Next. When the fight, Texas Aggies face number one ranked Crimson Tide of Alabama. Bama may be without their star quarterback, Bryce Young. The Crimson Tide star quarterback suffered a sprain in his AC joint when he was sacked in the second quarter against Arkansas and jammed his shoulder. He's listed as day-to-day -day by head coach Nick Saban, who said he did some things in practice. If Young can't go, then Bama will have to go with a backup, Jalen Milrow, who filled in for Young in the 49-26 win over Arkansas. How does that change the Aggies' game plan? We got prepared for both um, Bryce and um, what's his name, Jalen. Yeah, we got to um, prepare for both. But no matter who we play, we know we, we just got to go out and execute. I feel like more of the story, if we execute, like it doesn't matter who we play, who we face, it'll be a good game for us. All right, kickoff in Tuscaloosa on Saturday between A&M and Alabama set for 7 p.m. Texas Longhorns are preparing for the annual Red River rivalry when they face the Oklahoma Sooners in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas right in the middle of the state fair. And there's still a question of who will start at quarterback. Will it be Quinn Hewers back at practice recovering from a clavicle sprain? He suffered in that narrow loss to Alabama. Does the fact that the Sooners have struggled in the Big 12 so far with two losses, including last week's 55-24 to route by TCU, make this a trap game for Texas? Is head coach Steve Sarkeesian worried his players will take the Sooners too lightly? I don't know how we could ever think to do that. Um, this this rivalry, this game, um, and what it all stands for, and the way these two teams plays have have played in this game for decades. Uh, we know more than ever uh, we're we're going to get the best version of them. Uh, we need to make sure that they get the best version of us. Uh, they're a very talented team. They're an extremely well-coached team. Hey, we, we go through ebb and flows of a season, new coaching staff, new team. I w we went through it too, but uh, this team's really good, and they play really hard, and they're really well-coached, and uh, we have our work cut out for us, and we need to play a very good football game to be victorious. And you can watch the Texas OU game live on KSAT 12 this Saturday with kickoff set for 11 a.m. I don't know how much longer they're going to play this in the Cotton Bowl because it's very restricted seating, but it is a cool sight to watch. The colors of both sides are literally split right down the middle. Yeah, it'll be it'll be sad if they ever leave the cotton. Yeah, but it's sooner or later. I think it's it winds happen. up in Jerry World or home and home. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. You got it. We're back in two minutes. Gorgeous picture tonight of tonight's sunset from Skywatcher on our KSAC Connect uh, feature there. Thank you so much for sending in that picture fitting into the show here as we see temperatures Cool in the morning, comfortable in the afternoons, and only a 10% chance for a stray shower on Friday and Saturday. I like Skywatcher. Me too. Yeah. I said I'm going to call him Luke. <laughs> he dug it. Luke Skywatcher. Yeah, he's fine with that.